I'm Sharon Squassoni, and I direct the Proliferation Prevention Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, headquartered in Washington, D.C. And I'm pleased to have two colleagues with me today, uh, Dr. Peter Hayes, who's the director of the Nautilus Institute, and Dr. Takuya Hattori, who is the president of the Japan Atomic Industrial Forum here in Tokyo. And both of my friends here uh, participated in our workshop on uh, the implications of <coughs> Japan's fuel cycle <coughs> decisions. So before our audience, who uh, may not be so steeped in <laughs> nuclear <laughs> engineering and fuel cycle, um, what are we talking about here? We're talking about not just uranium enrichment, but also spent fuel reprocessing and Japan's overall approach to nuclear energy. So, Hattori-san, what are uh, the, the factors that Japan now, both the industry and the government, has to consider as it looks at, you know, how to restart reactors, what it should do with enrichment and <coughs> reprocessing, what it should do with its fast reactor, you know, the, the whole kit and caboodle, as they say. Yes, Japan is uh, now is facing a very complicated situation. Yeah. So many factors we have to consider, so many variables, and so it's not so easy to, to make a scenario for the, for the future mm -hmm. at the present time. Mm -hmm. The first, all the nuclear power plants shut down, and when can we restart, and how, how many units. Mm -hmm. And out of these, how many MOX plan is so MOX is MOX mixed is oxide, mixed oxide fuel. In the burning, the, the consuming, the plutonium. Right. And uh, also the, the Japanese nuclear power stations, the storage capacity, spent fuel storage capacity is not enough to, to operate for the long term. So once you restart the reactors, <coughs> your spent fuel, spent fuel is building up and you need to do something yes, with something. it. Mm -hmm. And un very fortunately, or unfortunately, now is all the nuclear plant shut down and no spent fuel generated in this year. Right. But when it starts, the spent fuel will generate it. And also the Locasho, the, the deprocessing plant, is not yet started. That's a long-term construction period. And uh, now it's uh, under review by the regulatory body. And when can they start? It's not, not, not clear. And also the MOX plant, MOX um, fabrication plant is under construction. Mm -hmm. It is uh, now is officially started uh, uh, 2017, but no one knows when. Mm -hmm. And also that we have so much plutonium stockpile in overseas in UK and also in France, how to consume without the actor. Right. <laughs> and so it's impossible. Right. That's 37 tons yeah. overseas, which is a lot. Lots. How long does it take to burn Oh, that it, up? Uh, it uh, depends on how many units, how many MOX units can start, MOX plant mm -hmm. can start. And originally, before the uh, Fukushima accident, we are considering uh, 16 to 18 units with uh, the MOX uh, mm -hmm. burning, MOX, with MOX program, mm -hmm. and they will start until 2015. But at present time, such kind of program is postponed. Right. Yeah. And so, but the, the, the Abe government has been a supporter yes. of nuclear energy in contrast <coughs> to the previous yeah. administration. Um, and the recent decision in, uh, I think just, was it last year, this year or last year, was that nuclear energy was still important, yeah. still for baseload energy. This, uh, this April. This, this April, April, this, this April. past April. Yeah. And that Japan was going to go forward with reprocessing. Reprocessing also, yes. So I think I know the technical reasons for, for why you would do that, but I, I want to turn to Peter a little bit and we'll go back and forth. 
What does that look like from the international perspective uh, for um, Japan to just go, f you know, make decisions about its reprocessing even before the, the future of its reactors is well, clear. Shanta, from inside Japan, of course, this is a deeply democratic country uh, and one of the most democratic countries in the world. And so it's, it's sometimes difficult for outsiders to really perceive and to understand the, I think, the true uh, dynamics. And uh, I certainly don't pretend to understand them as someone who doesn't live here and, and doesn't actually even speak Japanese, but I've observed the situation for a long time. Um, and, and from the outside, uh, at this point, I think people are asking the question, why a country uh, that doesn't have an urgent use for so much plutonium would want to make more, given that it can be used for nuclear weapons, that's how most people perceive it, uh, and given that there's no um, uh, urgent need to go down this path because there's a lot of uranium in the world. And so that's then viewed as a sort of plutonium overhang, if you like. Uh, and people are, are questioning, I think, Japan's motivations. Uh, many of them, I think, are quite misinformed. It's a form of uh, mis misunderstanding, misinterpretation, even uh, political warfare against Japan uh, when I see some of the statements that are made in places like Beijing or South Korea. But of course, there are deep historical roots to some of the animosity here, so it's not surprising. And I think all states ultimately have to look at the technological capacities of potential adversaries uh, or even current friends, because in the world of geopolitics, friends can become enemies over time and vice versa. And they ask themselves, do they have to hedge against the uncertainty of the future intentions of a country uh, and therefore start planning for the worst case contingency, which is of course that Japan would go nuclear. Uh, and so part of the, the other part of the cultural problem of interpreting the post Fukushima Japanese decisions, at least from, from where I sit, uh, is to what extent the internal nuclear culture of the, uh, what is often called the nuclear village, the, the relationship between the nuclear industry itself, deeply and profoundly committed over many decades to a breeder reactor plutonium based future that would get them off dependence on imported oil and imported uranium has made the shift post Fukushima to giving up that vision and just focusing on light water reactors and getting rid of all the accumulated plutonium or to what extent is it the old vision that's driving the industry to circle the wagons around a smaller number of reactors to keep that vision alive. And then finally, there's a security cultural issue. Of course, Japan has a very important alliance with the United States. Uh, and I think there is deep concern in some circles that some of what may be loose lips or it may be intentional statements that Japan's technological capacities, which in some respects are no different from any other modern industrial country, except that they have all this plutonium, uh, may actually be wanting to keep a technological deterrent, as it's called in the literature, uh, on the back shelf as a hedge against future uncertainty uh, in the alliance. And so this, that's in some respects, is now an alliance issue which is interacting with other factors uh, in terms of the revision of the Japanese constitution and how US forces and Japanese forces uh, work to deal with regional security issues. So there are quite a few different layers to this onion and uh, they interact with each other, they have their separate dynamics, and I think it creates enormous difficulty for those who are responsible for dealing with, with the, uh, the full impact of Fukushima, not to mention the economic impacts of having to import a lot of gas. So right. it's pretty complicated. So, so peeling back <laughs> those yeah. layers just a little bit, can you give us a, a kind of inside look at how that, how, how Japan should handle that plutonium as it, given, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? How many reactors will come online, whether they'll use MOX, but what's the, what's the best case that can be made for, you know, m making more plutonium before the entire 
stockpile is used up? Yeah, before thinking about this in the next scenario, that we have to consider, <coughs> we Jap Japanese government decide for the, the basic design, basic uh, energy policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that policy, that is a very key, this time is a very important warning, key warning, that is flexible mm -hmm. to consider the, the, the circumstances. And also the transparency is the most important to, to get an understanding from the international community. Mm -hmm. And so especially in the case of the to handling the plutonium, that is a sensitive material. And so without international understanding, it's impossible. And so we have already have the huge amount of the stockpile. Mm -hmm. And but the new generation by the operating the Locasho, we have to consider the, the current situation. Mm -hmm. And so this how to how how much the capacity can we uh, operate to Lokasha without uh, with uh, the limited the the consumption limited consume that is the limited number of the MOX plant, and so we have to changing or flexible uh, we have to uh, adjusting. Mm -hmm. The, to the to from the the original or former the planning. So when, by adjustment, you mean you might operate Rakasho at a lower level. Lower level. Of that capacity. that might be the one of the option. And so, uh -huh. yeah. What what other technical options are there for for being more flexible? Mm, how to the balance for the consumed uh, the Rakasho and also the we have, the, we have also the reduce the stockpile on the overseas, have the balance one, how much one. The, the, at first for the overseas, at that time we cannot, we can't operate. And so we, we, will, we would like to operate, then we have to establish the current technology and at the minimum level. And also we have to consume the overseas stockpile and that is the balance. I don't, we, we have to have such kind of scenario from the viewpoint of that, as I mentioned. <clears throat> right, so, so industry, right, is supposed to, as I understand it, but please correct me if I'm wrong, industry was supposed to come up with some sort of plan for how that plutonium Venus, Venus would, yeah. would move through the system. Is, is that completed or? Is, will there ever be a plan like that, or we're just going to be flexible? <laughs> oh, that's already completed, the technically completed. Okay. But we haven't get the final approval from the uh, regulatory body. Okay, so that would be the Nuclear Regulatory, Nuclear authority. regulatory authority Agency. Yeah. And authority, yeah. there, they have to approve that yeah. industry plan. Is that different than it used to be? Oh, that's uh, the, after the Fukushima. It's a completely different one. Yeah. Right. And so more severe uh, regulation. Right. So yeah. the government is paying government a waiting. closer attention yeah. Yeah. to how that works. How does that work internationally, Peter? Well, to be honest, I, I think if, if folks saw um, some other options also being explored, people would have less concern in places like South Korea. I mean, there are two, two levels of, of international concern or perception, let me put it that way, uh, coming from a place like South Korea or even from the United States or Australia. Um, uh, the, the, the first is that uh, going down further down the path of, of Rakasho is really, um, um, how shall I say, you know, if you're already facing a dead end, I'm just putting this in a very crude sort of metaphor, you don't go further down the cul-de-sac, you try and back off. And the question ultimately is, is the spent fuel a resource or is it something that has to be disposed of? And if you make that fundamental choice or at least start to explore the, the fact that you're at a crossroads and there are two roads to follow, then you'll start doing some other things. And I, I understand that recently, at, I think it was at Hamaloka, number one and two, mm -hmm. there was a decision <coughs> made very quietly uh, to actually activate dry cast storage on site, on the reactor. And this has been a, a key issue, is the difficulty of local communities 
that host reactors and get paid in effect to do so uh, uh, for the burden that they carry, whether they would accept dry cask storage as an alternative to sending it to uh, Rakasho and to other spent fuel storage facilities. Um, and it seems like there is a, a small shift in the politics and the culture here. So if people started to see more dry cask storage in play, they might have slightly less concern about what's going on with Rakasho and the attempt to keep the balance and the fact that that may be constipated in effect by failure at any one of the different variables that make it such a complex mm -hmm. terrain to try and uh, traverse. Um, I think the, the other problem that we have uh, is particularly in, in Korea, to a lesser extent Taiwan, they see an enormous double standard on the part of the United States, which is that they have uh, historically accepted a discriminatory regime where Japan would be allowed to have enrichment and plutonium reprocessing and they would not and they don't find that acceptable anymore. The United States on the other hand is trying to manage the incredibly difficult confrontation with North Korea and its breakout of nuclear weapons and the last thing they want is for the South Koreans to have enrichment capacity in country or plutonium reprocessing, so-called pyroprocessing in the South Korean version to match what Japan is doing. Yet it's going to be very difficult if Japan continues to go down the plutonium path in, in a way that is not just getting rid of the plutonium uh, that has been uh, created already but continues to make more and tries to design a energy strategy around plutonium. It's going to be very difficult to stop what is called nuclear sovereignty in Korea. That will become an unsustainable uh, security dilemma for the United States and it will make the North Korean situation worse. It will have an impact on the US-China relationship which is a vital global relationship. Mm -hmm. Less important at the moment than the US-Japan alliance but you know, <coughs> almost on a par in terms of the geopolitical weight. So these issues have global significance. They're not just local anymore. They probably never have been, but yeah. they, they certainly aren't today. The uh, one thing I'd like to underscore, though, is that the dry cask storage option doesn't force you to m make that decision that spent nuclear fuel is an asset or a liability, right? right. It's yes. just storing it Correct. for a while. And the costs are not so great right. that you know, you would look at it and say, well, there's a, a sunk cost and I can't move back from that at, at some point. You just take it out of storage and if you're going to reprocess in the future, you can do that. Yeah, um, that's, uh, you, you pointed at a very, very important point. That's in the, the new uh, energy plan, basic energy plan is uh, carefully described in the, the back end or the fuel cycle is in the context of the how to treat, how to manage with the spent fuel. That in that context, or the, the fuel cycle mm -hmm. is uh, written, described. And so at the first, we have to prepare the spent fuel storage capacity. And, this, uh, and that is in, in increase or keep. And that in, in the first option is dry cast storage. Should be one of the, the most important option to be pursued. That was clearly mentioned. In that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we are now just, uh, preparing for the dry cask. Now, and also, the, we will pursue the, the, the fair cycle. But now the, we, we take another year, so we don't know this. Right. I think the important um, point from a foreign perspective um, is. I guess I would pick up on your point about seeing that there are multiple options being taken mm -hmm. towards this, that it's not just a business as usual uh, approach, which is, gee, we, we're always going to reprocess, therefore we're going to continue to reprocess. In the non-proliferation world, we like to say, you know, we want to see an economic rationale. There has to be a logical path that makes sense when you're dealing with these sensitive dual-use technologies. Mm -hmm. Often for enrichment, we say, well, does it make economic sense? You need 15 reactors or whatever that magic number is. Um, 
on the reprocessing end of it, is there a magic number of nuclear reactors that Japan should be operating uh, for reprocessing to make sense, particularly since fast reactors are kind of pushed even further into the future? Yeah, this is in Japanese basic energy policy is another very important point. Is we will decrease the dependency on the nuclear power. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very complicated one. We will pursue the, the starting and also de the decrease the dependency. And that will uh, directly affect to the fuel cycle. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, you ask for how many units will finally, we will continue the operation. And uh, very much related to each other. And so, and in that context, we will decide, but it, it takes time, more time. We are now under discussion in the government for committee. Mm -hmm. That's, as, as a foreigner, it's very hard to understand that. Even us, it's yeah. very, very important, <laughs> very difficult to understand for them. Yeah. Not yet started for the, mm -hmm. the discussion. Yeah, decreased dependency from what we thought it was going to be, or fr not from what it is now today, because we don't have any nuclear power reactors operating. Yeah, I think I think there's one other sort of dimension to this, which you know, ultimately, I'm not quite sure what the timelines are, uh, but ultimately has to be answered, which is uh, with or without reprocessing, with or without recycling, with or without breeder reactors, there is a waste stream, a high level waste stream that has to be put somewhere safely uh, for you know, many um, hundreds of generations of human beings or you know, many hundreds of thousands of years. And Japan has traditionally focused on shallow geologic repositories for interim storage, be precisely because it's retrievable and potentially for long-term disposal. But Japan also has a lot of technological capacity for geothermal and for petroleum and other uh, types of drilling for deep borehole. Now, Japan itself is seismically very active and I may not be... Tell our listeners what is deep uh, I'm, borehole. I'm, I'm going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> is, is very active and may not be a suitable place to drill a borehole down three to five kilometers uh, which is what you need to do for a deep borehole, and then you're looking for a very stable geologic formation with no water, uh, and you would then drop down very carefully um, uh, the high-level wastes in their various possible forms, and then you would uh, basically back up the tunnel, fill it, and put a lid on, and you know, hope that no one ever goes down to take it out. It would be very expensive and difficult. And so from a... From and a, these are... Narrow things. I think right. of like a giant test tube, sort of. But well, it's just, it's just like a very deep, you know, if you drill a borehole to look for oil or gas, you do exactly the same, except you just keep on going. Right. And uh, there, there have been boreholes drilled down to 20 kilometers. So people go very deep. And there are a number of exploratory boreholes in Europe uh, in various parts of the world. And Japan has very strong technology in this area. Now, what this implies is that if there are really over the next 20 or 30 years, we discover through quite intensive research and development that deep boreholes are economically and uh, environmentally attractive ways for final irretrievable disposal relative to shallow subterranean disposal. Um, then it may be an offshore site that Japan needs to have using what would be from a global biospheric perspective, the best way to deal with the wastes. And so, to me, that implies the need for a global discussion, a very realistic discussion, uh, because we are all actually living on the same planet, and <laughs> there is a perfect mixing rate uh, in the atmosphere of about 30 years. Um, we do actually have to deal with this problem, not just in Japan, but elsewhere. Uh, it seems to me that Japan needs to contribute substantially to this effort to really see if there are actually two ways, effectively, to deal with the with the ultimate waste disposal. And then if the resolution of the plutonium recycling, reprocessing breeder set of questions, which I think are unanswered, which is why we don't have good answers to how much, when, where are we going at the moment, are resolved to say, in fact, 
plutonium is not a resource it should be disposed of, you've got a much more effective uh, set of options in 30 years whilst you've been using various forms of interim storage, including dry cask storage. So and these so are your multiple pathways, your dry cask right. interim storage plus... Potentially deep borehole. And there are studies borehole. now in Korea, uh, in China, underway on deep borehole. Uh, I know from experts at the University of Tokyo that there's been some research done here, but because the official future for so many years was to retrieve the material and use it in breeders that you know the idea was keep it accessible but safe mm -hmm. uh, and now I think the question is actually on the agenda do you need in fact an ultimate disposal and there are two I think pathways to explore mm -hmm. and you, you do better to have more than one option mm -hmm. yes and in any for the research and development areas would be Japan have to con contribute to based on the accumulation for the sulfur and Japan is a very highly uh, innovative for technology mm -hmm. was accumulated. Mm -hmm. And so that is our Japan's, the law and the Japan's the duty mm -hmm. to contribute in that area. And one thing that I would like to talk about, uh, about the nuclear fissure, mm -hmm. uh, the, the climate change that is uh, next year, this uh, COP21 in Paris, by that time, we Japan have to, how much can we reduce the greenhouse gas emission? Mm -hmm. And in that time, so nuclear power, how much in the future? That is very important. That kind of feedback to the, for the discussion. Mm -hmm. That might be a very important factor to consider the, the nuclear future in Japan. Mm -hmm. Hattori-san, one last question. As <coughs> we from outside Japan look at uh, how Japan is handling all this. What, what can the industry do to um, allay concerns uh, or not so much allay concerns, but just help us understand what's really going on? <laughs> mm. As I mentioned, there's a transparency is most important and we we are very closely contact with uh, with the government and also the international community. We jive, and we will uh, we uh, from the industry point of view, we will do our best for. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>